Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's podcast. So um, today I was hoping to talk about something that we've all been through, I think, and that's grand rounds or major rounds or consultant rounds, whatever you want to call it. In every institution, something of that nature happens. And, you know, it's always interesting how people interpret that situation and, and how they act upon it. And, you know, I got asked first I got multiple comments about this, and I've been asked to give this talk multiple times. I'm not sure why. I don't think I'm a very good speaker, but the key question is, how do you prepare for rounds in a way that makes it sound good, quote, unquote, and, and there's no good. I've always found that the best way to describe these things are as a rite of passage. You know, if, if you're an R3 or an R2, it's your proving ground to sound like an attending. If you're an attending, it's your proving ground to sound like an expert in the field that you have an interest in. And the best way to do that is to develop your own style and to start with something that you have a passion for. So, you know, I think I have a passion for shock in general, uh, hemorrhagic shock in particular, and complex systems. N not, not, not in the um, colloquial sense of complexity, but in a system design sense. And so these things are, are, I find I'm extremely passionate about. And through time, you develop these cues and these techniques, and, and some of it is your own personality, but some of it is also your familiarity with the content and having an organized approach. And that's my aim today. It's to transition you from, you know, this to this. And there's no easy way of doing that. You're going to have to practice and practice and practice again. So when you think about the types of presentations that we're asked to do, Journal clubs, morbidity and mortality meetings, tumor boards to an extent, though I'm probably not going to touch on it for, for that much of the presentation. And, you know, I think that to begin with, you're going to need to understand why we do presentations and what the benefits are. So way back when, we kind of understood that doctors, barbers, and apothecaries were three different things. Doctors in general... Um, studied illness and attempted to cure it through um, good quote-unquote ways. Barbers, on the other hand, uh, would be like short order cooks. It was very strongly felt that the barbers just haphazardly hacked at things. And apothecaries were thought of at one point to be extremely smart in developing potions, subsequently thought of to be um, literally snake oil salesman, which, you know, has a hint of truth to, truth to it. But between the three, there were people who were famous doctors, famous barbers, and famous apothecaries. And by the time Paracelsus came around, he had noted that there's there are two things that Paracelsus did that almost every person who was remembered fondly, maybe never discovered anything, but remembered fondly, it did. The first was he was a very good philosopher. The second was he understood the community that he worked for. And one of the things that he wrote very early on in his career was that in his time, well, what he said was, in my time, there are no doctors who could cure a toothache, never mind the severe disease. I sought wildly the certain experienced knowledge of art of medicine. I did not seek it from the learned doctors, I also inquired shearers, barbers, wise men and women, exorcisers, alchemists, monks, noblemen, and humble people. Now, what Paracelsus did was he had meetings, effectively. He had extended interviews with these people, and he would note down every single thing that they said. And he would figure out what worked and what didn't. And he eventually wrote multiple books. And one of those books uh, ended up being about pharmacy effectively or the beginnings of pharmacy but he wrote other books about shock about other things and you know he, he had an extremely long name his actual full name was philippus areolus theophrastus bombastus von honhorn do not ask me to say that a second time and you can read about him in a book called 10 drugs phenomenal book there's even an audio book if you like those things but he wrote significant treaties on pain control resuscitation migraine sepsis and antibiotics and the basis was just sitting down, talking, and seeing what works. That's one aspect. 
So one aspect is the clear exchange of information and expertise among different fields. The second reason why ground rounds or meetings are extremely important are because of the Kolb cycle experiential learning. So when you look at experiential learning, i.e. learning by experience, it's a little bit inefficient, especially in 2020. It works, but it's inefficient. If somebody relies purely on their own myopic experience, so if somebody says, in my experience, this is what I would do, and doesn't recognize the limitations of their experience, in order to obtain maximum yield from that experience, they have to reflectively observe. So for their experience to be distilled into a very strong, raw knowledge base that's fairly solid, you know, and we've all had these, these like champion level surgeons or champion level anesthetists or resuscitationists. And these guys are like, they're doing things that you would consider extremely off base for any guideline or any, any paper or any evidence base. They're doing stuff that is clearly not reproducible beyond anything that you would think that somebody should be allowed to do. And they not only do they get away with it, but they produce results that you can even hope to produce. The reason is not because they're highly experienced. That's part of it. The more important reason is because they spend an extremely long amount of time reflecting on what they've done and why they did it and reflecting on other people's actions. That's called reflective observation. And what that does is that it teaches them to link the parts of their brain that perform the action with specific memory centers in order to form an abstract concept, right? And this is the, the, the neurological context of concepts. From there, they go into active experiential learning through active experimentation. So they figure out where the evidence leads them, what the limitations of the current evidence is, and then they try and figure out why that's limited. And based on that, they come up with a plan that they apply. That's how you get those rock stars. It's not just the experience, right? When you come to decision making in general, and I'm sure that anybody who's read Kahneman and Traversky or any of those books, and I think Scott Weingart did a very good podcast on this a couple of years back. In general, we tend to use system one and system two. Think of them as two different brains, not one brain. So one high level processor with an extremely low latency that can produce decisions very quickly and one low level processor. And we use these things when we're dealing with patients every single day, making clinical decisions. The high level processor is fast, it's automatic, it's impulsive, and it's associated with an unconscious emotional process. The low level processor, or system two, is an extremely intricate neural network. It runs almost like a real parallel neural network in AI terms. And what it does is that it links up different parts of the brain that can simulate both the rational and the logical and come up with an analysis that tells you what to do. Effectively, every single day that you make a decision, whether it's a crisis-based decision or a decision that happens right off the bat because you feel like it, or any type of decision clinically, even a well-thought-out one or what you deem to be well-thought-out, if you're making the decision, not if the guideline tells you to make the decision, not if you have an in-hospital protocol for it, but if you're making the active decision, you're relying on these two systems. For these two systems to function and for them to, 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 to benefit you in your daily practice, they need to be fed information. No matter how you look at it, these systems cannot run without data. Okay? Now, What's sort of behind the scenes is the reason why these systems need the data is because they need to activate certain action potentials, so electrical signals in different parts of the brain, in order to deposit more myelin. Because the more myelin you have, the quicker the impulses happen and the faster the decision-making process is. And that leads to mastery, mastery and expertise. Um, I think I'm going to do a whole sort of talk on, on, on cognitive aspects of decision-making processes and expertise. Uh, there's a very good book called The Talent Code. Um, I might recommend it in the show notes um, if I have the link. It's an excellent book for this. 
So for us to be able to produce this font of information, to be able to make critical decisions, whether we're experts, we rely on experiential learning, or whether we're relying on system one and system two, no matter what theory you ascribe to, you need to have a myelinated circuit. You need to have a circuit that's been tested, tried, and fed data, troubleshooted, if you will. Journal clubs, M&Ms, tumor boards, they help you do that. You and the rest of the audience, if there's active participation. So, journal clubs are relatively easy. Uh, M&Ms, you need to be careful. You're in Tigerland there. Uh, tumor board, usually it's a senior level thing to do, um, but we'll go through it. And, you know, these are the chief and resident presentations. You should get your chiefs involved if you're the attending. And you should allow them to present every now and then just to get them to be involved and develop the skill set early. Now, I can only talk about my background as a surgeon. So I, I got a lot of great comments the uh, past couple of days, just offhand. Um, but you know, I hate to disappoint the people who thought that I was an anesthetist or an emergency physician. Um, it's very flattering, but uh, I'm actually a surgeon. That's my background, right? Nothing that you will do in surgery will require any intelligence. I'll be the first one to tell you that, okay? My colleagues will argue with me, but I don't think that it requires intelligence necessarily. But it does require a skill set, tactics, and strategy. The underlying cognitive process. The quicker you pick these up, the better it works out. Intelligence helps, but practice makes you perfect. All forms of PowerPoint should, in general, be evidence-based. There should be a reference somewhere. Okay, and this forms a very small part of your evaluation in life, but a very big part of, of your identity, your professional identity. If you're the type of guy who knows how to talk, knows how to give talks, knows how to set up for discussions, uh, can run a remote conference, for example, you're like miles ahead of the game, man. Um, it's not even a joke. If you're the type of person who... Um, copies and pastes, let's say, or gets incredibly shy, or just picks the wrong topic and doesn't know what to do with it, you're less likely to be actively involved in conferences and things like that. I don't believe that anybody's like that at the end of their career, but I think that it takes a while to develop this learning cover. It was one of the hardest things for me, certainly. So let's start with Journal Club. That'll be about 80% of our talk today. So why do we have them? So the original Journal Club started at St. Bart's. Um, which is a center I had the pleasure of visiting in the UK just for historical purposes because I have no life. And it was started by Sir James Paget as a, you know, a kind of club or a small room over a baker's shop near the hospital gate where we'd sit and read journals. Basically, they were pirating. They would lend their journals out to each other uh, because they cost so much at the time. Osler's early journal club was for the purchase and distribution of periodicals, which he could ill afford to subscribe to. So Osler literally said that he used to steal people's articles and swap them over. So it was very similar to the discussions that we're having today. Same thing. I'm still a very big fan of open access. I think that it's the future. I don't think that there's an ethical reason for us to block off access. I think that the reasons that we have outlined these days don't make sense. There, there shouldn't be a fee for me to get published and then a second fee uh, for somebody to read the paper. Like, I, I don't... Somebody explain that to me. I might be naive. I probably, probably am naive, but somebody explain that to me. Is there any real data for journal clubs? Well, there is, and I would suggest that everybody reads this paper, which is actually open access. This paper pretty much proves they're a very small RCT where they looked at two different groups, uh, one group, each with only 20, but for, for educational purposes, this is like pretty good. 20 people were randomized, and they were compared based on metrics of the number of articles that they read, uh, how complete the reading was, how much of their knowledge base had changed, and they even did a cognitive mapping analysis. And what they found was that journal clubs, just having them once a month, increased the yield by about 10%. It increased people's ability to perform well under circumstances and to improve their practice by, by, by about 10%, right? And that's pretty significant. So why do we have them? Well, when you look at the cognitive mapping, what tends to happen is 
you have a twofold path. The first part of the path is just changing your reading habits. It becomes a habit to read every day. I personally read for an hour in the morning and an hour at night. But in addition to that, you also develop a knowledge of epidemiology and biostatistics that eventually improves your critical appraisal skills, which translates to better system two thinking. I'm not going to go through how because it would take me three hours. And, you know, I personally think that anything over half an hour for a podcast is a bit too much, but we'll see. And as your critical appraisal improves, it changes the ability for you to read effectively eventually allowing you to incorporate the literature in your medical practice better, right? So it's a twofold path cognitively. You're getting two benefits. You're reading quicker and more efficiently, and you're also developing skills that allow you to figure out the good from the bad. And this has been replicated in multiple places. So culturally, Middle Eastern countries have a different culture towards these things because we tend to want to impress more. I'm Middle Eastern. When I when I present in 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 my part of the world, um, it becomes more of a impressive thing as opposed to a a, a open ended discussion. Things are changing. I'm not criticizing anything. I'm just saying that the overall culture is it pressures you a little bit more, right? But even in the Middle East, the same thing happened. You had a significant like I'm talking a percentage number here of improvement, right? And just the journal club in and of itself changed the way that, that, that the staff or the attendings and the junior members of faculty had discussions. And that's, that's amazing, right? It changes your team dynamics. So you're getting three different benefits. Cognitive benefits, the ability to read more. And in addition to that, you're getting to know your team more, making them more efficient, right? Now, the anatomy of journal club should include a well-constructed clinical question, a searching for evidence, critical appraisal, and commentary and discussion. Personally, I like to split between the juniors and the seniors. Increasingly, I've been getting the juniors to concentrate on point one and point two and perfecting it, and I give them a hard time over it when they're presenting. And the seniors, more so on critical appraisal and commentary. You should basically construct a question, pick two articles to try and answer it. They can be controversial, they can be rare, they can be landmark articles, or they can be shit. Whatever you choose, it's all good, right? Most of the time, I like to get the people cho to choose them by themselves. I like to get the residents involved to choose them by themselves. I would really love it if I could get nursing involved, but we're still not at that stage yet where I work right now. And we try and summarize them. Now, your options for the summary include PICO, which is Population, Intervention, Control, and Outcome. Or you can briefly summarize the aim, uh, population, methods, and results. Or summarize the purpose, the findings of the paper, methodology, and the conclusion. And it should be about four to six slides. Five to six, five points per slide. Four to five points per slide, right? And, you know, I would say PICO is for the good quality studies. And just a summary of purpose, methodology, and results is for the study that you know is crap, but it's the best study on in that field, right? There are other tools that you can use to figure out whether a study is good or not. So I would say that the best resource is the JAMA Evidence website. It's amazing. There's a whole book there. There's also the CASP checklist. It wasn't originally designed for, for critical appraisal in general. It was designed for you to figure out your own stuff as opposed to other people's. But it's amazing. I, I love it. You know, um, there's also a checklist that you can use in this manner. You can download them as PDFs, and that actually helps you to document your feedback. Um, there's the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. All their stuff is free, okay, and you can even get CME points off of them, which is amazing. I think um, similar situation there. So you have a bunch of different ways of doing things, right? And a lot of these tools are designed for you to design studies as well. So you're getting a two-for-one deal because you're learning how to develop observational versus randomized studies versus literature reviews. And you're also learning where you can make mistakes. And, and you know, in 2020, to get that much stuff, it's just, just amazing, right? You're getting so many benefits from doing your journal club in this way, right? Um, there's the Cochrane Compendium, which I think everybody should get. The Cochrane Guideline for How to Write a, a, a Review or meta-analysis is also very important and ultimately if you really can't get anywhere you should do four slides to organize the good the bad the ugly and the conclusion 
Now, I've never had to do this after my third year as a resident, okay? But when I was in my third year, there was that one paper where it was just bad. But it was the only paper on the subject. But it was so bad. It was painful. It was like a case series, but it really wasn't. And they did a weird meta-analysis thing where they scored the papers for accuracy and I don't they were doing like data resolution studies the only thing they can do with a paper like that is to go good bad and ugly and then the conclusion my advice is if you have a paper volunteer it if you read a paper and have an opinion about it save it email it to yourself and write it later uh, today's journal club is probably going to evolve into another type of presentation all seniors realize the effort that you're putting in all senior members of faculty know that you're working out, out kinks so if you mess up present a second time and prove yourself all right yeah ultimately with our surgical background we like to think that we're tough so whenever we mess up we just get back on there but if if you're if you're the type of person who has problems with public speaking and things aren't going very well know that everybody's been through it everybody i will guarantee you everybody has a story like that now m ms are a different story welcome to the ufc m ms are tough man One person usually presents. When that person presents, don't try and be the hero. It's a very fine art to know what to say and what not to say and when to interrupt. So don't interrupt the person. Let them defend themselves in as much as you can. Every now and then, given how heated the discussions get, especially in the surgical M&Ms and ICU M&Ms, I have to say, it's extremely important that you know how to advocate. But it's a fine art to know what to say and what not to say. But as with everything that is an art, there is a set of rules and structures involved. There are some Emory University templates. I haven't included them because I believe that they're not Creative Commons, but you can take a look at them yourself. And you can use certain abridged versions like the one that I've included. So my approach is I get a piece of paper and I draw four line, uh, two lines across, creating four boxes. I put the timeline in a box where the event, the investigations, what happened, what's the negative outcome, any past medical, surgical history, and allergies, and then I circle what's relevant there, and then what would be preventable, what are the options, and what literature do I remember for this particular case. And then the clavian classification, and if there's any other risk stratification I can use to make this more preventable and to discuss the preventability of it. I circle whatever's relevant on the sheet. I present with a PowerPoint based on these four slides. And then I provide relevant imaging, blood tests, cultures, etc. And I should be able to answer four questions. What happened? Why? Is it preventable? And what I learned? There should be some literature review, I find, if it's going to be in front of a division, because in a division there are urologists, there are general surgeons, there are orthopedic surgeons. And most of the time, there's more than one person involved in the case. There's more than one specialty involved in the case in 2020, right? multiple oncologists, you could have a sarcoma guy with the plastics guy, and you need to have that discussion, and you need to get them to discuss it with you so that you increase the yield for everybody and you reduce the blame. And I'll talk about that in a second. Because it becomes a very charged situation. Expect to be challenged, okay? This is your practice. It's this, consider this a mock oral, or consider this like your Royal College exam or your American Board exams, right? This is the oral part of the American Board exams, okay? you will be challenged and I personally try to do one a month just to get used to being asked difficult questions this skill set will help you if you're ever in court God forbid if you're ever uh, challenged over decision-making process God forbid if you are ever um, have to sit another exam like I do in about a month um, all of these things you know to practice for them, these seminars are great because no matter what happens, if it's a heated discussion, they're going to blame each other and they're going to blame you and you're going to be able to defend yourself. But you have to play it cool. Okay? And here's just a template. So here's where at the surgical service involved, the name of the presenter and the date, admitting diagnosis, procedure performed, care provided and complications, any past medical surgical history, any background involved, whether it's preventable or not, and relevant points. This is the Clavian classification. Uh, I like it because it allows you to put things across an yardstick. 
And I also like to do a root cause analysis if I'm the attending who's presenting. So at junior level, not so much. At senior level, it's extremely important to recognize this concept. And what a root cause analysis is, is it's an analysis to see what and underlying factors contributed to the complication or the event. From the individual factors to the environmental to team factors, rules and policies, patient factors and organizational factors. This allows you to gain some sort of organizational closure. But there's always that one person who screams while you're presenting, in retrospect, would you not have done X or Y or Z? My advice is play it cool. Just say that sounds like a very good idea. But if you look at the flow of the patient's stay in the hospital and the patient's flow and path through the hospital logistically, I don't think that study X, study Y, based on scoring system Z, would have contributed differently. Because I fundamentally believe that the vast majority of hindsight bias impacts our impression of quality of care negatively and unrealistically. And you know, I would read this editorial, so I'm only including the abstract, but I think that it's extremely important that, that we get over this hindsight bias, right? I think a hindsight bias is, is it's not good, all right? It's good to reflect on your own, but it's not good to get called out in a meeting based on hindsight. It just does not make sense to me, okay? Your reality is it's very hard for you to tell me that hindsight bias or screaming, why didn't you write an incident report in the middle of a closed meeting where we're all supposed to be benefiting and recognizing the limitations of our organization and how we can improve. Because most of these outcomes are non-preventable and we know it, right? So uh, that's why I like a root cause analysis at attending level, because it gives you something to help you guide the conversation. And finally, include a review of the literature and recommendations. So with incident reporting, I think I'll reserve my opinion a little bit later, but in general, I don't think that they work. Okay, um, that's sort of my 20 minute talk on how to write talks uh, for your department. Um, I think that I'm probably going to follow this up with one talk on hindsight bias and possibly another talk on incident reporting. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you for the amazing feedback. Uh, it is really an honor to be thought of as an anesthetist and as an emergency physician. Um, I think that my mentors would be extremely proud. And obviously, keep leaving feedback, please, by all means. Um, whenever I get emails or things like this, it's amazing. Like, I, I genuinely, it really does, you know, it's a great encouragement. And I realize that it's still a little bit sort of rough around the edges, but hopefully uh, I'll continue to improve over the next couple of months. So please subscribe and uh, thank you for listening.